Good afternoon, and thanks to those who have joined us so far. We are going to give it about 45 more seconds or so, give everybody a chance to get logged in, and we will get started. All right, we have hit that 1201 mark. We're gonna go ahead and get started as people are hopefully continuing to join us. Good afternoon. Welcome to the HFMA Colorado chapter webinar series. Make sure you follow us on our social media um, to find out more about upcoming events, upcoming webinars. We would love to see you at a future event as well. We do wanna take a moment to recognize our annual business partners. Their support allows us to operate our chapter and to bring our members quality education and resources. We hope that you will take a look at them first when your organization needs services or support. Do you wanna remind everyone that certification is now included in your membership. Study materials are online and all the modules can be completed on demand and at a time that's convenient to you. It's never been easier to get certified. So if you're interested and you'd like more information, please contact the chapter and we can get you hooked up with that. I wanna direct your attention to the chat button. We will be using the chat for any questions that you have during the session. Um, please go ahead and put those in. We, I know our speakers and our panelists would love to be able to address any questions you have. Today's webinar is brought to us by Change Healthcare. I'd like everyone to join me in welcoming our speaker, Kelsey Hurt, VP of Financial Clearance. Kelsey has more than 15 years of progressively responsible experience as a multifunctional healthcare leader in revenue cycle management, healthcare information management, and information technology le leadership. Sorry about that. In her roles, Kelsey has worked for multiple hospitals and health systems, has provided consulting services to hospitals and health systems, and has worked for technology and RCM service, services suppliers, and has driven value for both hospital and non-hospital providers. During her career, Kelsey has overseen all aspects of the revenue cycle and has had particular focus on the implementation and integration of IT systems, reporting, coding, and clinical documentation improvement. I am very excited to welcome Kelsey. Thank you, Jessica. And hello, everybody. I just want to first make sure, I just want to do an audio test, even though we joined early, just to make sure there was no technical difficulties. Can everybody hear me okay? I'm hearing you just fine. So. Okay, thank you for confirming, Jessica. And, and Jessica, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for the very thorough introduction. Very excited to be here um, and, and talk about this exciting topic. Um, Brad, I'm gonna make sure you can share, share the presentation and just share your screen before we continue. Excellent, perfect. Okay, the perfect storm question mark. I think several on this call would say that this is definitely a relative title based on what we are all encountering in our roles and respective organizations. Again, thank you for joining today and participating in this hot topic of preparing for the end of the public health emergency and continuous enrollment requirement during labor shortages. Here is our agenda for today. So we're going to start with the current situation and market condition, conditions, then moving on to planning for the end of the PHE and CER. And then we will um, end it by you know, talking about preparing for the end of the PHE and CER. Um, and really, you know, some of the details surrounding change healthcare's approach, approach to this time frame. We're going to start off with a look at the current situation and the market conditions that are impacting the situation. But first, 
let's take a quick pulse check with, uh, with our first polling question. Our first polling question, number one, how confident are you that your organization has developed a plan for the end of the PHE and CER? And then while you guys are thinking about that and answering it, um, I know Jessica had mentioned that this is about a 30 second opportunity to respond. Okay, and then my favorite part, I just love to see, um, you know, the, the, where the majority lands. So just so that the group understands, and this is just a really fun, engaging, you know, side of the presentation. Just, so just thanks for your participation. And just so everybody um, knows that the, the bulk of the audience today um, responded to this question with somewhat confident. So great. The continuous enrollment requirement, which dictates that in exchange for extra funding, states cannot require Medicaid and CHIP, you'll, you'll also hear me refer to that as CHIP redetermination until the public health emergency is ended. This became law in March of 2020. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation research, this population has increased by nearly 25%, which equates to about 17.7 million people since then. The continuing enrollment requirement also reduced Medicaid churn, which can slow provider reimbursement and acts as an access barrier. States are required to create and publish plans for unwinding the public health emergency. But according to the Georgetown University Unwinding Tracker, only five states have completed the required unwinding documentation as of September 6th. That means the majority of hospitals in the US are in the dark about what plans their state is making for the end of the public health emergency and continuous enrollment requirement. Now, all of this is all likely to happen during the current labor shortage. The October 7th, 2022 labor report showed a 3.5% unemployment rate, which is tied to a 50 year low. Healthcare has traditionally faced labor shortages in clinical functions, but the current situation has greatly impacted administrative functions as well, particularly mission critical revenue cycle functions. Finally, the American Hospital Association reports that more than half of the hospitals are expected to have negative margins this year. You can imagine the impact to these organizations when their uncompensated care costs and denials increase due to Medicaid disenrollments. Because when front end labor shortages occur, RCM leaders pull teams from eligibility and enrollment to focus on patient scheduling, demographic capture, et cetera, driving up uncompensated care. The Center on Budget and Policy Priorities showed that uncompensated care is particularly an issue in the states that have not expanded Medicaid, and that states that expanded Medicaid have significantly lower percentage of uncompensated care. However, the Kaiser Family Foundation predicts that states that expanded Medicaid, like Colorado, will feel a larger impact of the unwinding because states that expanded Medicaid saw a larger increase in the number of people who qualified for Medicaid during the pandemic. Another potential negative impact is the sidelining of complex claims, such as for motor vehicle accidents or workers' compensation. Manual work, unfamiliar forms, dealing with liens are all activities that suffer during a labor shortage. In this case, the impact could be large. Complex claims tend to pay out at a higher rate than health plan claims, with some paying 100% of bill charges. Now, all of this is all likely to happen during the current labor shortage. Um, Brad, go down one more slide. That was, that was a repeat. Thank you. The shortage negatively impacts hospital front end RCM functions, which is the first crucial interaction that a patient has with your organization. A positive patient access experience can help boost patient experience scores. 
a negative patient experience can help decrease those scores. Every moment that a phone in patient is on hold, every minute that a live patient waits in the waiting room for the patient access person to call their name can negatively impact that patient's perception of their care, even if their clinical care and outcomes were excellent. Labor shortages or use of temporary labor can exacerbate these issues. So you may be asking yourselves, what steps can you take to help alleviate the impact of the labor shortage in general, but particularly during the unwinding, when your teams are likely to be stretched thin? Automate as much work as you can and outsource as much work as you can. Doing so can help you deliver on you know, an outstanding patient experience and reduce the number of schedule slots that go unfilled it can help you improve collection of co-pays, co-insurance, and self-pay dollars. It will ensure that your claims are cleaner, cutting denials, and reducing costly post-treatment rework. It will help you set realistic patient financial expectations and avoid surprise billing, and it will help you retain patients in your network rather than having them seek care elsewhere because they are tired of waiting. It will set the tone um, and additionally, as the public health emergency comes to an end, your patient access function can be part of a robust strategy to mitigate the impact of disenrollments on your bottom line. For example, some providers are using their patient access centers for outbound outreach to their known Medicaid and CHIP patients to ensure they have the most up-to-date contact information and plan to alert them when the government ends the public health emergency. And now it's time for our second polling question. How do your organization's revenue cycle management labor challenges compare to the clinical labor shortage providers have faced for the last few years? And again, you will have 30 seconds to respond. The results are in. Okay, 67% of today's audience responded to this question with ours are slightly worse than the clinical side and 33% um, indicated that the clinical sides are slightly worse. So, so nobody responded with ours are um, significantly worse than the clinical side. The first or the fourth answer nobody responded with. Okay. So now let's take a look at an approach to help you prepare for the end of the PHE and CER. So I think a lot, a lot of the individuals on the call are probably asking you know, themselves why now? Um, so I'm sure you know, some of you are thinking, okay, you know, good information, but nothing I need to worry about until CMS ends the public health emergency. And they have just extended it again right after the midterms, this announcement came out. So, you know, when CMS announces the end of the public health emergency, they have said that they will do so with the 60-day notice. If you wait to start engaging your state, your team, and external resources, you'll be fighting for attention against other hospitals and likely will not have time for supplementary or outsourced services to be implemented and brought up to speed. Act now to get in front of identifying and creating the plan that's right for your organization, budgeting and contracting, hiring, onboarding, and training new team members or, 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 or outsourced service suppliers. The fact is this, if you aren't already evaluating your readiness, your state's readiness, and planning for the end of the PHE, then you are putting revenue and cash flow at risk. Our recommendation is to plan now to prevent issues when the public health emergency ends. So at the highest level, there are nine steps you can take to prepare for the end of the PHE and the continuous enrollment requirement. First, evaluate your readiness. We'll look at three key points you have to identify as soon as possible. 
after you've evaluated your readiness, quantify the impact to your organization. You'll need a few inputs for this. Next, take a look at how you will define success. What will you measure? What are your baselines? After you have some rough internal projects of potential revenue impact, start evaluating your potential staffing needs. Are you already down FTEs? What type of increase do you expect in patient communications, call center operations, eligibility and enrollment functions, and even on the back end for your denials team? Will you need to invest in people, technology, or both? What budget do you have or what investment can you make? Are you prepared for the rework that comes along with an increase in denials? Have you automated all of the functions that you can? Examples might be AI driven, virtual assistants who can help patients schedule their own appointments over the phone, or digital patient engagement technology, such as digital scheduling, reminders, and more. Finally, is this an opportunity for your organization to implement innovations in process or technology? Brad, next slide. Let's look at evaluating your re readiness. You need to ask yourself three questions. If you don't know the answers to all three questions, you need to find the answers as soon as possible so that you are ready for planning. You can see the three questions here. Who in your state will oversee unwinding? Are they already working closely with providers? Have they communicated their plans? Who in your organization will oversee unwinding? What authority, tools, and budget will they need to be successful? From here, you need to understand what your state's unwinding plans are. As mentioned earlier, they are required by Medicaid to prepare unwinding plans, and what steps you choose to take may be impacted by your state's plans. As of early September, only 28 states had published their plans or a summary of their plans. It is critical that you stay on top of developments in your states to understand what steps they plan to take and within what time frame. Each state will have different plans, fiscal pressures, workforce limitations, and volume of work. Kaiser Family Foundation outlined actions that the greatest number of states said they plan on taking to unwind. The majority plan to take steps to update enrollee mailing addresses, take up to 12 months to process renewals, and then an extra two months on top of that to finish any work in progress. Follow up with enrollees when action is required to maintain coverage. Boost Medicaid eligibility staff capacity. Create a plan for prioritizing renewals. Medicaid has suggested that providers may wanna take steps similar to their states, and some are already taking some of these steps themselves. For example, providers are planning to use calling campaigns to make sure their contact info for their existing Medicaid patients is up to date, planning outreach campaigns to that population for when, for when the end of the PHE is announced, ramping up their eligibility function to help with identifying new sources of coverage for those patients who lose Medicaid coverage, and implementing new technologies to automate front-end functions and identify disenrolled Medicaid claims retrospectively. You'll wanna analyze some of the social determinants of health for your Medicaid population because these may impact your patient's ability to complete redetermination. For example, what percentage of your Medicaid population are non-English speakers? This is a huge issue in some communities. Some technologies will help you communicate with these populations in numerous languages. Others will only have one or two, and then you might need to rely on translators and phone outreach for the rest. Who might have trouble reading or have writing difficulties? Those in larger metropolitan areas need to be thinking about their transient population. What about Medicaid patients who aren't transient? Many people will have moved within the past three years, and the Kaiser Family Foundation estimates that 9% of Medicaid patients move in-state annually and 1% move out of state. If the state is not able to reach these patients, will you be able to? Do you have a high percentage of Medicaid patient population that lives in a heavily polluted area or does not have safe, safe drinking water? 
all social determinants of health can impact your patient population's ability to have redeterminations completed in a timely manner. Now let's start quantifying some of the direct impact the unwinding will have on your organization. The first step is to evaluate where you stand with your current Medicaid and CHIP populations. What percentage of your patients are currently using Medicaid or CHIP? What is the difference between your, histor your historical average percentage of Medicaid patients and your current percentage? The difference between the two will help you evaluate the potential impact on your organization. What is your average Medicaid reimbursement in dollars? Multiplying active Medicaid patients by your average Medicaid reimbursement will give you a rough approximation of the potential increase in uncompensated care your organization faces. Now, every state pays differently for Medicaid and CHIP. So here's an example using fake numbers. You can see the walkthrough just to help illustrate this and you can really plug and play your respective numbers accordingly so you can understand the true impact. Now scale this example up to, again, to your real numbers for a rough approximation. For most providers, the impact will be significant. You can use this number as a guide to help you determine what types of investment you should make in mitigating the impact of the end of the PHE. Next, let's take a look at some of the indirect impact to your organization, because indirect impact can still mean a significant blow to your bottom line. For example, if the labor shortage makes it difficult for you to recruit, hire, and train people, you will be impacting all of your patients, not just your Medicaid and CHIP patients. Increased phone hold times will, call, what will cause patients in competitive areas to abandon their calls and try a competitor. A slower eligibility and enrollment process will impact all patients, not just those on Medicaid. And your patient throughput will slow overall as your team processes, processes new applications for benefits. Next, you'll likely see an increase in calls coming into your access center. If you can't handle the patient's needs or manage these calls in a timely manner, you will potentially lose new patients, volume, and referral traffic at the end of the day. Finally, in addition to the increase in uncompensated care, you'll have costs associated with rework and lost revenue tied to denials. Now that you've analyzed the potential disenrollments and redeterminations your team may be facing, and you've evaluated the steps your state will be taking to unwind the continuous enrollment requirement, it's time to put your action plan together. You should be thinking about the size of the universe you need to communicate with. This will drive your analysis of whether you are adequately staffed to conduct the communications that will help prevent negative revenue impact due to the unwinding. In addition to ensuring you have the right size staff for your, com your communication needs, think about these issues. What technologies can I use to communicate with my patients? Will I need additional call center team members? How many touches will it take for me to update contact information and alert to need, to need for redetermination when the public health emergency ends? Will we want to or need to reschedule routine or non-urgent appointments during the unwinding? Will I need additional eligibility and enrollment specialists? Do I want to increase my number of benefit advisors who deliver financial counseling? Is our back end adequately staffed to deal with a potential influx of denials? The most effective ways to communicate with each person. This is important. Different people respond to communication media in different ways. For example, some people prefer text messages or email, some prefer to chat on the phone, and still others want print mail or in person interactions. How will you reach all of these people? Do you have the technology tools in place to communicate with patients through their preferred medium? What messages do you wanna convey and what information do you wanna gather? For example, I wanna ensure I have the most up-to-date contact information and I wanna let them know that they will need to take steps for redetermination by X date 
and after the end of the PHE is announced. I want to let people who likely won't qualify for Medicaid again know that if they do not have any other coverage, we can help them identify potential sources of care coverage. I want to reassure my long-term Medicaid patients that we have their backs as they go through redetermination. After the end of the public health emergency is announced, ensure that your messaging answers all of the following questions for your patients. What date the PHE and CER end? What your state is doing to help the process? What steps they can take now to help ensure that they do not have a lapse in coverage? If they expect a lapse in coverage, here are some steps they can take. Any special processes or rules or rule exceptions that your organization is putting into place to, to ensure patients receive the care they need during the unwinding transition. Look at a combination of proven technology and expert services to help you mitigate risk during the unwinding while delivering an outstanding patient experience. Patient engagement technology can help you enable patient self-service for digital activities like appointment scheduling and rescheduling, getting on smart wait lists when looking for an earlier appointment, registration, digital forms, and more. You can also use this technology to, um, with patients outside of their planned encounters to improve patient satisfaction and loyalty. Patient access center services, particularly in the form of outsourced call center operations that blends technology, AI technology for simple calls with expert associates who handle all issues that can't be handled by technology. If you go this route, ensure you choose a partner who handles your patients with respect, compassion, and confidentiality. Financial clearance technology and solutions. Look for eligibility and enrollment experts who leverage AI-driven technology to uncover both care funding sources and community services like food banks and transportation options to help patients beyond just their care payments. How easy is it for your patients to share with your eligibility and enrollment experts the documentation necessary to process redetermination? These front-end activities impact every aspect of your revenue cycle and are critical to your operations at all times, but will be especially important during the unwinding. Now determine how are you going to define success? Your metric should be based on your objectives, so not everyone will have the same metrics. Some areas that might be evaluated include call center metrics, such as hold time and abandonment, abandonment, abandonment rate, <laughs> eligibility and enrollment related metrics, such as percentage of uncompensated care and percentage of patients that your team identifies new care funding for. A key metric for all organizations will continue to be patient satisfaction. You don't want your scores to, to fall thanks to a messy and unplanned unwinding. In all cases, determine your objectives, Choose the metrics you will use to measure your progress and then set your baselines immediately. Still at the front end of the revenue cycle, consider your needs related to budget to budget, staff, automation, and engagement. You might wanna ask your team questions such as, how many of our patients do we need to communicate with? Do we have their current contact information? If not, how can we get it? Are there activities we can automate? Are we staffed appropriately to meet our needs? And then on the back end, do we have sufficient denial staff to handle the forecasted increase in denials? From a denials perspective, evaluate outsourcing to denials experts or implementing a technology solution, solution that can use AI to identify denials before they happen by identifying coverage gaps and potential funding sources without violating CMS and payer anti-phishing rules. Brad, there you go, thank you. So now that you've done all of the prep work, 
the real work begins. So first, ensure that your plan, including any new or temporary processes are documented. Make them easily accessible for your team members to refer to. Ensure that you have identified the metrics you will use and that your processes will enable you to gather the data necessary to evaluate those metrics. Next, determine how you will resource. Can you, can you invest in new technology to automate communication and other activities necessary to alleviate the burden of the unwinding? Will you be able to hire the FTEs or temps that you will need to be able to deliver on your plan or is the labor shortage making hiring difficult? Are temps a good solution? Will they deliver the patient experience that you strive to deliver? Can you work with a services partner to augment your team's needs, for example, to conduct a calling campaign to your Medicaid population or to handle overflow calls when wait times get long? Should you outsource much of your front end activities to help alleviate labor shortages and improve performance? For example, if you are in a high cost of living area, you may choose a remote staffing option to outsource to lower cost of living areas or even global areas to optimize your labor spending. You may choose to outsource your entire front end activities and use your existing staff for other revenue protecting activities. We'll look at an outsourcing solution in the next section of the presentation. When your plan is documented and you are resourced, it's time to educate the team. Make sure they understand what the unwinding is, how it will impact your Medicaid patients and how to treat them with respect and care, how it will impact your business, call volumes and eligibility needs, what new processes are in place to help ensure patient care is covered and revenue is protected, and how the entire revenue cycle management team should deal with issues that may arise, such as an increase in denials on the back end then it's time to execute your plan. So as we've discussed, the unwinding will definitely impact your front end RCM activities because they will impact access and eligibility functions. Patient access acts as the first touch for most patients and sets the tone for all following interactions. Additionally, patient experience, growth, and financial performance have a symbiotic relationship. A positive patient financial experience positively impacts overall patient experience. A positive patient experience drives referrals, referrals drive volume growth, and at the end of the day, improves financial performance. Front end experiences are directly impacted by the labor shortage and will be exacerbated by the unwinding. Labor shortages in access drive long hold times. Long call, long call hold times negatively impact experience. Long call hold times impact volume by driving call abandonment. By evaluating your current status and planning for the unwinding, you will be able to help mitigate patient access and patient satisfaction risk while also reducing revenue losses. Our final polling question. Compared to how you answered at the beginning of the presentation, want to circle back to polling question number one. How confident are you that your organization has developed a plan for the end of the PHE and CER? Okay, um, so 22% of you said you're still as confident as you were, 44% I'm a little bit worried, and 33% we have a good amount of work to do. Um, and the good news is 0% did say we're in big trouble, so nobody responded with that answer. That answer. Okay, so, so moving to, to our summary. So really in summary, I know we've walked through a lot of information today. You know, we've identified your existing Medicaid patients at, at risk of disenrollment early. 
We've discussed how you can improve financial performance. We've discussed um, how you can mitigate, mitigate or prevent uncompensated care. We've discussed several ways or solutions to drive efficiencies overall. We've discussed how you should be um, looking into, if you're not already, how to leverage innovative technologies to help solve for this and prepare for this. We've talked about um, just labor headaches, like recruiting and training, and how you can take that off your plate here by exploring um, outsourcing as an option. And at, and at the center of all of this, just, just patient experience, centricity, and loyalty. Um, that has definitely be a, been a trended topic today in terms of what, what you can do to influence, you know, the most important piece here. So that concludes our presentation, and we have left plenty of time for, for Q&A. Really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you again for being here. We do have some extra time, so I'd love to encourage anyone, if you have any questions, you can pop those into the chat, but, uh, chat box, or I can always unmute you if you want, if it's easier to just ask your question um, verbally. But we'll, uh, we'll give it a few seconds. If anyone has any questions for Kelsey, we'd, I'm sure she would love to be able to address those. And Jessica, um, I, Jessica, sorry, while we're waiting, if anybody does not think of any questions today, is there um, a pathway that you can maybe point out to just get those questions our way and then we can answer them? You know, yes, post absolutely. Okay. I Wait. also just going to mention that in that chat box is the presentation. So we have provided that there for you so you can go on and download that. And I believe in your presentation, um, I guess I'll have to Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure, Kelsey, your information is included in there so that people can reach out. If not, I will make sure that I send that out in a post webinar. Yeah, Jessica, it's not in the slide. It's okay. not in the slide. So um, yes, please provide that on the side. And I, I will get that out to everyone then for Excellent. sure. Perfect. All right. Well, I'm not seeing anything coming through here. Um, so I think we will go ahead and let everyone have, oh, uh, Mary, you don't see the download. It should be just up. Let me, oh, you know what, Mary, that's not my, on me. Um, hang on just a second and I'll get it in there. I had shared it before, but I accidentally just shared it with the other panelists. We understand that this is a lot of information <laughs> to digest. So um, hopefully today was very, very helpful and insightful. And, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself um, if you think of any questions after today's session. Perfect. Hey, Mary, um, if you could give me a thumbs up and let me know if that it did actually come through there. I think I got it right this time. But while um, I do just want to thank everyone for attending, Kelsey, I really appreciate you providing this information to us. We appreciate your time being here. Um, for certificates, those will be sent out in about a week or so. Um, I do want to tell everyone to save the date. Our annual conference is April 13th through the 14th. It'll be located down in the Denver Tech Center, and we hope that we will see you all there. Mary, um, it looks like there's still some issues, so I'll just let everyone know. I will attach the presentation to an email and send it out to everyone who was registered. So that way we make sure you get all the information you need, and I'll include Kelsey's contact information at that time too. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. And Kelsey, thanks again. Thanks for having us. Take care, all everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.